Hart hasn't been seen since his cameo in 2008's Trinity Volume 1 Issue 24. He's actually only appeared about 19 times in total. His first appearance in 1993 is in Bloody London. For real, he is just a guy, he was a dock worker and he has no powers or anything like that, unless you count him being super loyal and super brave. These two traits in particular made him the ideal candidate to defend England as part of a government operative. His impressive lineage was a bonus. He is a direct descendant of King Richard I of England, also known as Richard the Lionheart. Modern Lionheart's civilian name is Richard Plant. We know where the Richard and Lionheart came from, but his last name is from the royal house King Richard was in. He's super English. Lionheart's super suit is a suit of armor with a big blazing energy sword. The armor lets Richard fly and makes him extra strong, but not strong enough to defeat aliens apparently, at least not at first. Joining up with the Justice League, they fought a bunch of alien parasites that were making London's rivers run red. This entire plot was called Bloodlines and it will come back. Lionheart did get bitten by an alien, tragic, but he lived and continued to fight another day, still teaming up with the Justice League in the future. During the whole Bloodlines thing, most people who survived alien bites got powers, but it doesn't look like that happened to Lionheart. Did you know that being annoying is not only a talent, but also a superpower. The heckler is the best at it. His special power is the ability to annoy anybody, which is true. It's annoying how he randomly appears and then disappears forever. His last appearance was more recent. He was in the 2021 series One Star Squadron. It was only about six issues, but it was a lot of fun. The heckler is part of a team of heroes who could make these lists. They are basically on-call superheroes. You use their on-demand hero app to order. The heckler is just funny. Everything about him. His his creator, Keith Giffen, created him in the first place because he wanted to work with Bugs Bunny but felt that it wouldn't be approved, so he made a superhero Bugs Bunny. Like Bugs, the heckler essentially makes his opponents destroy themselves through smart mouth comments and pointed insults. In issue 3 of his 6 issue series, they invented a new zodiac sign for him, Hecalarius. If you were born between Pisces and Aries on a leap year, then you are actually Hecalarius. That means you're bright, mirthful, and mischievous. This isn't important, I just think it's funny and relevant because it's a leap year this year. The Heckler's civilian identity is Stuart Mosley, the awkward owner of Skid Row Diner Eats. The Heckler has been in about 14 or 15 comics. He was supposed to get one more, but the seventh Heckler comic never made it to print. That's all, folks. Argus is the name of a few different DC things, the most popular being a US government agency, but the lesser known Argus is Nick Kovac. The US government knows him as Nick Kelly for all the right reasons, though. After his father passed, Nick joined the army as Nick Kelly proving himself capable, he later joined the FBI. Eventually, he had a run in with an alien, much like our guy Lionheart, and was bit, but he got superpowers. The powers included the regular stuff like extra strength and speed and reflexes, but he also got enhanced vision and invisibility. In Greek mythology, Argus was a giant with a hundred eyes, so it's thought that Nick drew inspo from this when he was choosing his hero name. His enhanced vision is very, very enhanced. He can see ultraviolet, radio waves, X ray, infrared, if you're lying through illusions and slightly see the future, which is kind of wild. He's teamed up with the Flash to defeat an evil robot. Much to his displeasure, he doesn't like the Flash. Argus has had his fair share of hero trauma. At one point, he had his eyes removed, which would be awful for anyone. But if your entire power set is based on your ability to see, that's extra not good. He did get them back though. The last time we saw Argus was in the 2009's Faces of Evil, Prometheus 1, and he was in a team of three. Fortunately, our guy survived but one team member didn't, and he hasn't been seen since. Yet another victim of the alien snacking habits is Joe Public. He was a regular Gotham City gym teacher who deeply cared for his students and wanted to see them succeed. When one of his students passed due to a bad, colorful set of pills, he decided to track down the dealer. He knew it was someone called Happy Jack, and the good news is, so did Batman. During the hunt is when Joe and Happy Jack were attacked by the hungry alien. Joe survived, Jack didn't. His power was the ability to absorb the strength and energy of what's around him, but he has to stay near the person or he will lose the power. Him and Batman defeated the alien that bit Joe, and Joe fully stepped into a life of heroics after. He continued to partner with Batman on occasion, one time taking down Corrosive Man. Joe, to my understanding, is just Joe. He is face out, only sunglasses for his eyes, real name is his super name, which is rare. In 1996 is his last appearance and mention. He appears as a hallucination in Batman Shadow of the Bat issue 50, and then in issue 53 he is mentioned mentioned by another character to be a friendly vigilante, which implies that he is still out on the town fighting crime. Technically, this next guy did 
did disappear because he moved six feet under, but he's so funny, I could not let him slip under the radar. His name is Defendestrator from now on, Mr. D. He was a member of Super Squad Section 8. He did start as a bit of a bad guy. He went to Arkham Asylum for attacking an officer, but he was reformed and joined the hero team, which is great. We never get the chance to learn his real name because unfortunately, Mr. D gets caught in a crossfire and doesn't make it. His first appearance was in Hitman 18 in 1997, and it was only three years later, in issue 52, that he was gone forever. Now, the reason this man has made this list is because his method of fighting is maybe my favorite I've ever seen. He carries a window around and smashes it on the enemy's head. And I can't figure out if the window is a magic window that regenerates after each hit, or if he smashes it and then has to go get another window from somewhere. I think it's regenerating because in issue 52 in the beginning of the battle, it gets blown up, but the next window he uses looks exactly like the first window and he wouldn't have had time to get another window the next time he uses a window. A case could also be made for the windows being held in his massive square looking suit jacket. Either way, this guy is hilarious and I hope he gets revived. Winona Little Bird, better known as Owl Woman, has been MIA since her appearance in 2006's Infinite Crisis 7. Fitting, honestly, considering she debuted in the 1986 comic Crisis on Infinite Earths 12. Went in with an Infinite Crisis, went out with an Infinite Crisis. So while I would like to see her again, it's kind of a full circle moment. She is a Native American hero. Her powers include heightened senses, and like an owl, she can see in the dark. She can fly using wind currents and later received some claws. Owl Woman was part of the Global Guardians, fighting alongside members of the Justice League until the team disbanded due to a lack of funding. Unfortunately, though she started out as a hero, she got brainwashed after the Guardians ended by someone named Queen Bee. Queen Bee was the one who gave her the claws and her plan was to take over the world. Original. Eventually, the brainwashing was reversed and Owl Woman went on to fight in crime again, even teaming up with Wonder Woman. I love this next kid because there are too many examples of heroes applying for a super squad and then not getting in and then turning into a villain because their feelings got hurt. But Color Kid, he took rejection like a champ and he didn't let that stop him from continuing to be a hero. He started out as a lab assistant, just a regular kid, and then was struck by a multicolored light beam from another dimension, average DC experience. The light beam gave him the power to change the color of any object. Excited by his new abilities, he traveled to Earth to audition for the Legion of Superheroes. Unfortunately, his powers, while cool, don't have much use when it comes to fighting crime, so he was rejected. Jokes on them though, one time his powers came in very useful when he changed a kryptonite cloud from green to blue, changing its chemical nature in the process, which meant it wasn't harmful to Superman anymore. He later developed the ability to camouflage himself and even create a sort of fog around people by changing the color of the air around them. So please give my guy some credit. He was a member of the Legion of Substitute Heroes for a while, which is basically made up of a bunch of people rejected from the first Legion. His last comic appearance was in 1994, and he was featured on the animated TV show Legion of Superheroes, which ended in 2008. Latino hero Bushmaster is all about the reptiles and fighting crime. He's teamed up with the likes of Batman and Robin and been a part of the Global Guardians too. His civilian name is Bernal Rojas. He has no superpowers, but is very intelligent. He started out as a world-renowned Venezuelan lizard scientist, so he's always been into reptiles. He brought this into his crime-fighting work by creating reptile-themed gadgets. To list a few, because I think they're neat, chameleonic camouflage, terrapin shell, and flying lizard wings, and more. During his time on the Global Guardians, he was also brainwashed, sad, but it's only a few battles later that he's back to himself. The really sad part is once he and the other Guardians parted ways, they are attacked and he doesn't make it. How could they do this to my guy? It happened in 1994's Justice League quarterly issue 17. He was around about eight years before his departure, debuting in 1987's Infinity Inc. 34. There may even be a second Bushmaster somewhere out there. In Final Crisis, a new guy is seen in the outfit running around, but we don't know anything about him. So keep an eye out for Bushmaster Part 2. Crimson Fox is pretty unique. There have been three people to take up the name, and yet only two versions of the hero. The original first Crimson Fox was a pair of twins, Vivian and Constance. Their parents were killed by a pharmaceutical company. Vowing revenge, the sister started a rival company and became the Crimson Fox. There was one problem, their company did so well, it put the other one out of business, meaning the sisters were now very public figures. They didn't want it to seem odd if a public figure disappeared every time a hero appeared, so they decided to fake one twin's death so they could be CEO while the other fights. The sisters drew straws to see who would have to fake their death, which is just something that I can see sisters doing. Their main power was pheromone control. They debuted in Justice League Europe in 1989, joining 
joining the Justice League of Europe. Unfortunately, Vivian passed while on a mission in 1995 and Constance followed in 1998. Years later, in 2006, another Crimson Fox appears and claims to have inherited the twins' fortune. We just don't know how. She's got all the abilities that the twins had and she's doing it basically how the twins did, so I say we let her keep going. Online, it lists her final appearance as Checkmate Volume 2, Issue 31, but in the comics, she's seen getting back up after the fight in there, so where did you go, girl? Crimson Fox has also been in two TV shows. The first was in the animated show Justice League Unlimited in 2006, and the next was in the 2017 live action show Powerless. Powerless would have been the last time a version of Crimson Fox was seen. A son of Superman and Wonder Woman is a big deal, so where did he go? Jonathan Kent too was born to the famous heroes in the reality we know as the Kingdom. He first appeared in 1996 in Kingdom Come 4. It's important to say that there are other Jonathan Kents, they are Superman's kids, but with other people in other universes, but this ain't about them. Today's Jonathan has got his parents' powers plus some bonus features. He can travel through time and between dimensions. The hyper time time manipulation is where he took the inspiration for his name, Hyperman. He seems like he would be a big deal, but he's only had about five appearances. That could have something to do with his life story. He was kidnapped as a child from his reality and brought to the main reality by a villain wanting to destroy Superman. His parents and Batman eventually rescued the baby, but he disappeared. Turns out the evil guy had reached hyper time on his way there, so Jonathan slipped back in where he was watched by himself, an older version of himself, the guardian of hyper time. When everything settled, the baby was returned to his parents so he could grow up to be the guardian hero in the future. That was in Justice Society. Society of America, Volume 3, Issue 22 in 2009, and that's all for him, I guess. Captain Adam is a hero that DC seemingly stopped caring about in 2011, which is also wild to think about when you realize just how powerful this guy is. Captain Adam is like Shazam in the sense that they were both characters DC amalgamated from other publishers. Shazam came from Fawcett Comics, whereas Captain Adam came from Charlton Comics, which, by the way, is the same publisher that Peacemaker also initially hailed from. But while Peacemaker has only become more relevant with time, Time, thanks to his amazing HBO Max and DC live action series, Captain Adam has become less and less relevant, sadly. He was considered a powerhouse back in the day, capable of reconstructing matter, self-sustenance, teleportation, and even time manipulation, to name a few of his abilities. But you wouldn't know it to see him lately. He rarely appears now, and when he does, it's normally to get beat up by other folks who he should, in theory, outclass, like Gotham Girl and the Fraction. Are there any heroes who you feel have been disrespected like this? Let me know in the comments, because this always bothers me when stuff like this happens. Captain Adam also served as the inspiration for Watchmen's Dr. Manhattan, but today, Dr. Manhattan, I would say, is more well-known and more relevant than Captain Adam himself now is. Wild. Speaking of someone who is less relevant now than when they first appeared, Maxima was initially a villain in the comics somewhat before she became a hero. She was introduced to us as an alien attracted to Earth kind of by Superman, whom she sought to become her mate, abandoning her betrothed at the time, Ultra. She made her first appearance in the 90s and honestly was a super 90s character. Like, look at this costume. Look at her original New Earth costume. Ah, that was what she was at least to start. In modern day, Maxima is still a queen and is an ally to Superman. She also ends up being in love with a woman and actually gets help from Wonder Woman to keep both her crown and her partner, but even then, that story actually happened back in 2020, so still, it's been a while. And that's with, once again, a Maxima who I feel like has been changed somewhat. This next character, who is someone who has been in and out of the spotlight for a while, swapping out now and then with another character who shares her hero name, is once again out of the spotlight. And I want to know, why can't we have have both. When it comes to Huntress, it seems like we can only ever have one of them at a time for some reason. Now don't get me wrong, I am a big fan, a big fan of Helena Wayne, of which we now have a version back again in this new golden age. But where, oh where, is Helena Bertinelli? I feel like anytime one Helena is in, the other one has to be out. Look at how many Spider-Mans Marvel has. I mean, I think we can handle two Huntresses, no? I feel like DC is like, you can't, you'll be confused. I'm like, dude, if I can understand your continuity, I can understand anything, anything. I could be a brain surgeon right now, but instead I read comics. The Huntress we are currently missing here is Helena Bertinelli, an ally of the Batman family and a member of the original Birds of Prey. Helena has sworn to fight against organized crime as part of a personal vendetta to get back at those who killed her family. She also has come into conflict with other vigilantes due to her willingness to kill her enemies, at least 
initially. As far as I can tell, the last major appearance of Bertinelli's Huntress was in The Shadows of the Bad Event in 2022 when she appeared in Detective Comics. But yeah, I feel like since Helena Wayne has come back in, she's kind of taken more of a backseat. So even though she did appear in that event, it still feels like we haven't really seen her. She's not as prominent as she used to be. This next character was so far out of the continuity that when I started watching Arrow vs. The Flash, I thought Cisco was a completely new character and hero who was made for this show. Yeah, that's how little I knew about this character, and I'm supposed to know everything about every character. Cisco Ramon in The Flash Show is a member of Barry Allen's Team Flash. He eventually goes on to gain premonition powers, which allow him to see into the future, which he calls vibing. He basically, like, touch a person and kind of see into their future, taking the superhero name for himself of Vibe. In the series, Cisco gets his powers from the same event that granted Barry his, the Particle Accelerator Explosion, at least initially. And I was surprised to learn that the character of Vibe was actually inspired by the original Vibe who appeared in the comics, or at least the Prime Earth version of Vibe, which was inspired by the original Vibe. The original comic book vibe was Paco Ramon, whose powers were based in Sonic Waves and who hails from the New Earth continuity. Now, the New 52 version from the Prime Earth continuity is Cisco Ramon, who first appeared back in 2012. He gets his powers from one of Darkseid's boom tubes, being exposed to the boom tube, which resulted in his DNA basically being rewritten, giving him powers. His powers are based on vibrational energy, allowing him to emit shock waves, but that's not all. He can also use his vibrational powers to sense and create holes in reality, allowing him to travel to other Earths. He can also vibe with people and get a sense of their past or present, but unlike the show, not their future. These next two heroes I'm going to talk about are a package deal. But we'll start off with the first one in the set, Hawk. Or at least the first one in terms of how most people order their names, I'd say. So, who is Hawk? He is one of the many Hank Halls to have existed over at DC Comics. Possibly one of the reasons why he's faded into the background. There's been a few Hank Halls, honestly. DC tends to shy away from characters who they think, like I said, might be too confusing. Huntress any Hank Halls, never seemingly considering that the continuity might be the most confusing thing for fans. Me included. Maybe you too. Hank's Hawk was initially paired up with his brother and is known as an Avatar of War. There have been many Hawks since then, but they've pretty much all come and gone since they've been introduced, and now we're back to Hank. The last we saw of Hank, I believe, was in Batman the Brave and the Bold, where he appeared in a cameo capacity alongside the current Dove. Alongside Hawk is typically Dove, the Avatar of Peace. Initially, this was Hank's brother, Don. Then following Don's death, it became Don Granger who is a girl, Dawn, D-A-W-N, who would act as Dove opposite her sister, Holly Granger. Currently, Dawn as Dove works in tandem with Hank, who is Hawk once more. Dove also, I believe, hasn't been seen since her cameo appearance alongside Hank in Batman the Brave and the Bold. And like Hawk, she's also not a prominent hero at DC Comics in the current continuity. At least, I wouldn't consider them to be prominent. Myself. Some characters fade into the background over time, and some fade into the background only shortly after being introduced to us. I'm actually sad that this hero didn't end up making it as a mainstay. Sideways was one of the heroes we got from what was supposed to be a new era of superheroes. These were all original and new DC heroes created as part of an initiative to basically bring something fresh to the table. Fresh characters, fresh heroes, as opposed to just doing the same thing over and over again. Sideways was kind of similar to Marvel's Spider-Man in terms of his look and to a certain extent his personality. He was a young hero thrown into the world of superheroes, struggling to find his place, a sense of balance, and get a handle on his new teleportation-based powers. Derek James, as Sideways, had the main power of opening up rifts, in some cases interdimensional ones, which he could use to teleport him and others through. While a cool and promising character initially, he got his own self-titled series, but afterwards, faded more into the background. His last appearance was more of a cameo and background one in the Dark Crisis event. This next hero hasn't even really got that courtesy though, it seems. For me, Dolphin is one of those characters that I feel like was really cool and I'm always anticipating her return as a result because I just want to see more of her. But as far as I can tell, we haven't seen her since 2017 in the comics when she appeared in volume eight of Aquaman. Now granted, there is a possibility I could be wrong about this 
or honestly any other character on the list. And if I am, I'm sorry, do let me know in the comments. I have an approximate knowledge of many things. I have approximate knowledge of many things. And the exact last appearances of characters, especially in the DC Comics world continuity, which are a little harder to verify without going back through every single issue from the publisher because of how information is categorized online. When it comes to Dolphin though, I know she is not well known enough for folks to know who I was talking about when I reacted to the Aquaman 2 trailer on my YouTube channel and incorrectly guessed that she might be the woman in the white costume who actually turned out to be Atlanta, Aquaman's mom. I thought maybe Queen Mera would die in the film and then Dolphin would basically come in to replace her as Aquaman's romantic partner. I was like, I was super psyched. I was like, oh my gosh, is Dolphin gonna be in this movie? Oh my gosh, I'm so ready. But I was very wrong about that. Still, Dolphin is a character I'd love to see more of in the DCU and in the comics. In the New Earth continuity, she is the result of an alien experiment, but in the Prime Earth continuity, she's an Atlantean. In both realities, she is an ally of Aquaman, and in the New Earth reality, she even ends up married to his adopted son, Tempest, with the two having a child together who's named Ceridian. Unfortunately, in that continuity, she and Ceridian perish when Atlantis is destroyed by the Spectre. Even in that continuity, she's gone. And in our continuity, we haven't seen her in a long time. Moving on, Aztec in the Prime Earth continuity was a hero who was introduced for one story arc in Justice League of America. Set up to be a much larger and important character in the canon, and then, without much warning, just faded into the background. Since then, she has made a few appearances in Wonder Woman. I will give you that she appeared in Tales of the Titans last September in issue number three, but at the same time, this is after not appearing for a few years, and even then, her appearances have not really been made. Aztec is Naeli Constant, who was given the power and responsibility of becoming a hero by her helm. As Aztec, she is tasked with continuing the ancient, never-ending fight against the dark god Tezcatlipoca. I bet most people also didn't even know that she was a legacy hero. Yeah, she is. Before we had Naeli, we also had Uno, who appears in both the New Earth and Prime Earth continuity. But despite DC trying to make Uno's Aztec a thing, it actually did not work out at all. He was only around for about four years, with him also getting getting his battle suit and helmet as well, and that's where his powers come from. They brought him back for the Prime Earth continuity, but only so they could basically kill him off, with Naeli inheriting his helm, suit, and mantle. And I guess they were hoping, you know, she could be Aztec, and maybe everyone will be into it. And then nothing really happened with Aztec. Finally, a few years back, DC hosted their Round Robin, where fans got to vote for which characters and teams would get comic series. One of the series I wanted to happen was focused on this hero, Captain Carrot. Captain Carrot is Rodney Rabbit. In the Prime Earth continuity, he is a Superman-like hero who hails from his own Earth, filled with other anthropomorphic animals like himself, Earth-26, formerly known as Earth-C back in the New Earth continuity. Needless to say, Captain Carrot did not make the cut for DC's Round Robin. I know I was one of the few that wanted that to happen, so I'm still waiting for him to come back into the spotlight again. He hasn't really been around in the comics since 2017, sadly. I've been your host, Amanda McKnight, but before I say my signature sign off line and let you go, I have an honorable mention for you, Green Lantern. And I know what you're thinking, Amanda, Green Lantern is still as relevant as ever and hasn't gotten anywhere. And yeah, that's true. But I wanna talk specifically about Jon Stewart, who is only an honorable mention for one reason. While we all know and love Jon, and he's actually apparently got a really solid comic book series going on right now, I just started playing Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, and I had to point out that we're falling into a pattern of Jon showing up or being included on a team just to die or be sacrificed in some way. So while it's not inherently disappearing, it's leaning that way. Kill the Justice League isn't the first time this happened. It also happened more recently in Dark Crisis when he just gotten back on the Justice League team. Granted, neither here or the rest of the League really died in that event, but still, it's a weird pattern and I needed to point it out. Please stop subbing John in if you're just gonna kill him. I love John Stewart. Jane Doe is a very creepy villain. And yet I feel like she has barely appeared in the comics since her introduction. I feel like we simply just forgot about her for some reason. Jane Doe was created by Ryan Sook and Dan Slott and made her first appearance back in 2003. She is a villain who likes to adopt the lives of her victims. She'll follow them, study them, and obsess over them until she feels she knows them inside and out. Then she exterminates them and um, adopts their identity, even going so far as to literally wear their skin. 
Next up, Ulysses had one very wild and powerful story, being introduced as a kind of Superman of his own from the fourth dimension. But shortly after that, he was never seen from again. His story involved him being spirited away to the fourth dimension when he was little by his parents, who were basically attempting to save him from an earthquake, which threatened their own lives at that time. Now, while he thought his parents and his original homeworld of Earth had perished, he later learned this wasn't so upon returning to it while chasing down one of his own villains. However, when he learned about the darker side of humanity, he decided the best course of action would be to save Earth from itself, preserving only six million of humanity's best and brightest, and letting the rest basically perish. This put him at odds with Superman. His parents, who had survived, actually, were able to appeal to Neil Queen, known as the hero Ulysses, and talk him down. But when the fourth dimension ended up destroyed, Ulysses blamed Superman and the two fought. A really interesting concept for a character, but after this story, he never really appears again. Dr. Poison did appear, at least in some capacity, a few years back. She had a small appearance in the Wonder Woman film that was part of the DC Extended Universe, since rebranded but also restarted and now known as simply the DCU. In the comics, she also appeared somewhat recently, likely thanks to her DCEU appearance, revitalizing an interest in this character. Her Prime Earth continuity version made her first appearance in 2016, a year before the Wonder Woman film came out, and we recently saw her in the Wonder Woman comic in 2022, but we haven't actually seen her since then, and she's an old and amazing character. She was admittedly pretty permanently defeated at the end of the story she last appeared in, though, being injected with her own poison and arrested. Talk about a taste of your own medicine. Amazo is another classic and also cool villain, but he very rarely appears in the comics these days. He's an android who can literally replicate the powers of any hero he comes up against. How awesome is that? He first appeared back in the 1960s and rarely appears in the modern age now, having most recently appeared, I believe, back in the Plastic Man Limited series in 2019. Next up, Prometheus was once a really epic Justice League villain, but he's changed a lot over the years, and also isn't as prominent as he once was in the comics. He's been seen in the modern comics, sure, but not for a few years now. In fact, I don't think we've really seen Prometheus as a threat in the comics since about 2018 or thereabouts. His origin story is similar to Batman's, but instead of becoming a hero, he becomes a villain. See, his parents were criminals who died at the hands of those upholding justice, and as a result, he has a vendetta against heroes and all those that fight for the just. Like Batman as well, he traveled the world to become more experienced in many different skill sets and would become extremely dangerous as a result. Prometheus is actually the one who killed Leanne, Roy Harper's daughter, which doesn't bear as much weight since she's now kind of back to being alive again, but at that time it was pretty dramatic and also led to Prometheus being killed in turn as revenge for her death. However, this was also back in the 2010s during the New Earth continuity. This next villain I believe we haven't seen since the Dark Knight's death metal event, which while not super long ago, was a few years ago now anyways. Parasite was a much more popular villain back in the New Earth continuity. The Rudy Jones Parasite, that is. The original Parasite, not the later versions. However, the fact that there were even other people who took up the mantle after Rudy does show the influence of Parasite was strong enough even to attempt such a thing at one point in time. Rudy Jones was once a regular appearing Superman villain. Initially, his story was that he'd been exposed to a biological weapon while working at Star Labs as a janitor, and this resulted in him becoming the villainous energy vampire Parasite. And yet the mighty threat he was once considered is no longer as relevant today as is seen in the revision made to his origin, where he actually got his powers instead from eating a radioactive donut. Yeah, I would say it sounds like a downgrade. They made him goofy. <laughs> a radioactive donut? Don't eat that. This next villain is really quite classic, but has changed a lot throughout the years. Doctor 13 has evolved into something different in more modern comics, with his original incarnation no longer even discernible in the modern version. Hence why I say he's disappeared. Although also even the modern Doctor 13 is no longer around either, but I digress. The original Doctor 13 was the villain of Dollman, a hero who most people also probably don't know about from DC Comics, cause Dollman. Dollman was a superhero who could shrink to the size of a small doll. So think like Ant-Man, but I guess kind of cuter because doll versus ant. Sorry, ants. You are also cute, but maybe not as cute as dolls, unless you're ants in doll form, and then, yeah, pretty cute, honestly. Doll Man and Doctor 13 both hailed initially from Quality Comics, which was later acquired by DC. I feel like many Martian Manhunter villains get the short end of the stick when it comes to getting featured in the comics, but this is probably also because they are sharing that short end of the stick with Martian Manhunter himself, who I feel very rarely gets enough time in the spotlight as a hero, either. One of Martian Manhunter's villains that I feel like we haven't seen in some time as a result is Dr. Trap. Dr. Trap hasn't shown up in the comics for I believe more than a decade, but 
You know who hasn't forgotten about him? The Harley Quinn animated series, baby. They don't forget anyone. Here's looking at you, Kite Man. Dr. Trap did make a small appearance in season two of that series. In the show, like in the comics, Dr. Trap is a supervillain who specializes in making traps. He was first introduced in the comics in the 90s, and honestly, he does sound like a pretty 90s villain. He also looks like one too. Next up, we have someone that we didn't even know was around until we found out they were, and then they were basically gone after that. Jor-El is a very interesting one. For years, he, like I said, didn't even really exist. Well, not in the living world. You see, Jor-El is Superman's father, and like the rest of Krypton, for a long time, we thought he was dead. However, it would later be revealed that he didn't die, but instead had been spying on his son Superman for years, monitoring his progress. Jor-El was revealed to be the true identity of the mysterious ally turned villain, Mr. Oz, and as far as I can tell, we haven't seen him since he died in the comics in 2019 in Superman issue 15. Jor-El had not perished on Krypton, it turned out. As the world ended, he was spirited away and taken to Earth, where he was corrupted and turned into a villain by the horror that is the cruelty of mankind, which he was witness to. From behind the scenes, he would watch his son's progress and occasionally manipulate the world around him. This next villain is one that I love and that I'm actually really sad is gone. Spook is a villain that you likely won't see anymore in the comics because, well, he's dead. But even before his death, he had pretty much been unseen and unheard of for years. Val Caliban first appeared in Detective Comics issue number 434 back in the 1970s. I've always thought he was a pretty cool villain, a man who worked in architecture and used that knowledge to escape the prisons he was later locked up in. Although his costume was definitely a bit goofy. But hey, it made him a good villain to use in the Scooby we do in DC Comics crossover comic that happened. Yep, Spook was appropriately featured there. Spook mainly appeared throughout the 70s and 80s here and there, and after returning in the early 2000s, once more breaking out of prison to appear again, he was only a few years later killed off by Damian Wayne, who separated the villain from his head. Oh, poor Spook. I don't believe we've seen him since then, actually, because, yeah. He's gone, unless we bring him back. You might know the Brown family thanks to Spider-Punk from the new Spider-Verse movie, but that family also exists in the 616 universe. Two notable heroes have emerged from the family of Eleven, Hobie as the Prowler and his older brother Abraham as the Black Tiger. Since Hobie has popped up a lot, we're focusing on the latter. Abraham Brown is a martial arts superstar that first appeared in April of 1974. He met and quickly became friends with other martial artists, Lin Sun and Bob Diamond. The trio found a set of J tiger amulets and decided to become the Sons of the Tigers. The trio later dispersed after a series of personal arguments and they lost their amulets. But before breaking up, they teamed up with other heroes like Spider-Man and the Human Torch. To take some time off, Abe was hopping on a plane to Algeria, but his suitcase had been switched. The new one containing the Black Tiger costume. Unfortunately for Abe, two other not-so-nice guys were also looking for this costume and hijacked his plane. But Abe is a superhero, so he survived. He managed to chase and capture one of the men, but they were then captured by a local tribe and forced to duel Black Panther style to see who will become the Black Tiger. We know how this ends, Brown officially takes up the Black Tiger mantle and his last known activities took place in 2017 as a member of the Penance Corps. Sometimes real life and the characters on the page are one in the same, and this is especially true in the case of the second Human Fly. The first was a villain, but this ain't about him. Our Human Fly superhero was a regular young man who got into a bad car accident. His injuries were very serious which led to him receiving a new skeleton made of steel. He was told that he will be paralyzed for the remainder of his life, but the human fly resolved that he would learn to move again. He began training his body and worked for years until he was even stronger than he was before the accident. He used his newfound strength and skills for good and became the human fly. This didn't come without confusion, the original human fly still existed. Spider-Man had a run-in with the hero at one point, thinking he was the evil guy. The human fly would also sometimes do daredevil stunts to raise money for charities for children with disabilities. Abilities. We never actually learn his name in the comics, but that's okay because we know his name in real life. The human fly hero is based on the very real stuntman, Rick Rahat. The tagline for the comic book was, the wildest superhero ever, because he's real. And the book itself featured photos of Rick in the human fly suit. One story that many Marvel fans hope will disappear is that of US-1, or the story of Ulysses Solomon Archer. The series is only 12 issues long and yet packed in a fight with a German Zeppelin captain, motorcycle gang, and 
aliens. The main problem people have had with this comic is the plot seems so unbelievable. A hard feat to accomplish when it comes to superheroes. But I guess an intergalactic trucker would do the trick. The reason for this seemingly odd plot choices is because the series was based on a line of toys. The Tyco Toy Slot Car Racing line. That is why the main character, Ulysses, wants to be a trucker so badly and even has a custom built semi truck, missiles and other fun gadgets. The gadgets aren't just in his truck, they are also in his head. In the first issue, Ulysses and his brother are driving down the highway but are run off the road by the main villain of the story, the Highwayman. The brother doesn't make it and Ulysses is barely holding on. To save his life, he gets a very durable metal skull replacement. The new skull is able to pick up on radio transmissions which comes in pretty handy. After this limited run was over in 1984, he makes a few appearances in the sensational She-Hulk, Annihilators and Deadpool team up. The last time he was seen on panel was in New Avengers Volume 2, Number 7. He's featured in a lineup of potential nannies to Jessica Jones and Luke Cage's daughter. He doesn't get the job, unfortunately. This next bunch went from one parody to another. The powerhouse pachyderms were originally planned to be a parody of other crime-fighting animal group, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The whole thing is a pretty funny concept. Instead of crime-fighting turtles, it's crime-fighting elephants. Their name? The Adult Thermonuclear Samurai Elephant. Iconic. However, not everything went to plan and there were some significant delays and so Marvel was forced to change the name and said that they were now a parody of the X-Men. Either way, the team of four first appeared in Power Pachyderms issue 1 in 1989 and that's it. That's all we ever get. The issue itself is a gem. We learned that the elephants were supercharged when their train car bound for the zoo was unhooked from the train by a monkey and they happened to jump track to one that leads to a nuclear test zone. Then there's a big explosion and that exposes the elephants to radiation, turning them into super elephants. They rejoin the circus briefly before heading off on their own, only to come back together to fight Clarinetto, former head of the Brotherhood of Musicians. The super elephants fight and defeat Clarinetto and his band of celebrity ninja impersonators. If it sounds ridiculous, that's because it is. The last panel even tells you to not take it seriously. And the elephants haven't been seen since 1989. The Sleaze Brothers also kicked off in 1989, what was in the air that year. This six issue limited series was specifically designed for adults. John Carnell is responsible for creating this wacky comic. The entire thing is a spin off from a one off comic strip created for Doctor Who called Follow That Tardis. This story follows a pair of brothers who grew up as orphans, but not on the earth we know. Their earth is far in the future and looks kind of like if you find steampunk in 80s neon aesthetics and use that to build a city. It's full of pollution and crimes and monsters and aliens and very corrupt and generally unwelcoming. So that's the vibe and the job the brothers have picked to survive this harsh landscape is Private Investigator. They are good at what they do, getting the right results, even if they don't always use the most morally sound methods. The comic itself wasn't received well and the first issue didn't sell well. The brothers were seen in the totally stonking, surprisingly educational and utterly mind-boggling comic relief comic and then the backup story in Image Comics Elephant Men issue 16. And then they haven't been seen since. Today, there are no nerds and jocks set aside your differences because Stanley said so. In 2011, Marvel partnered with the NHL of all things to create superheroes for every team. The project was called the Guardian 30 Project and for the most part, a team's hero would be an elevated version of their mascot. The Panthers is a Panther, you get it. All 30 heroes were featured in the 2011 All-Stars game, which for anyone who doesn't know, like me until last year, the All-Stars game brings together all the best players from all the hockey teams across the league. 2011's special presentation even involved a cameo from Stan Lee and a laser show. These things weren't meant to just be pictures. A CGI animated short was created to debut the hockey heroes, and there were even future plans for comics, movies, TV series. They planned for these to tap into the younger audience of hockey fans and become wildly successful. But if that were the case, they wouldn't be on this list. They flopped hard. The main issues with the supers was that many of them were just existing character designs with one or two differences and the storyline for the characters wasn't very compelling. They were drawings come to life instead of actual heroes in their own universe. Safe to say these heroes will probably be staying out of the game and in the penalty box for the future. Project Guardians wasn't the first time Stan Lee dipped into a new audience. In the year 2000, the Backstreet Project hit the shelves and the merch booth at the Backstreet Boys concerts. Backstreet Boy Nick Carter, a longtime comic fan, and Stan Lee 
longtime comic creator, combined forces to create the band's superhero team. Carter came up with the idea and originally hoped it would become a six part comic series. However, when he sat down with Lee, the pair just agreed on a single issue and a web series. The comic featured the band getting their powers for the first time, going from superstars to superheroes. The web series planned to have 22 episodes, but only seven were aired, and none of the actual Backstreet Boys took part in it, which is disappointing. Even Burger King got in on the project, creating a line of action figures to go with their kids' meals. I want one. With the rise in Y2K trends over the years, I think it's time for the band and the book to make a comeback. Once again, we are back with another Stan Lee venture. His animated web series ended up becoming wildly successful, being picked up by Fox for TV distribution. It was called The Seventh Portal. The story centered around Peter Littlecloud, his friends, and an interactive video game. The game promises the opportunity to actually fight monsters like a superhero. It claims to use holographic projections for the gameplay. In the game, there are seven dimensions, six are currently conquered by an evil villain, whereas the last one, our dimension, is safe. You choose a hero to play as to make sure the evil doesn't make its way through the portal. The game turns out too real for comfort. The way you really fight the monsters is by being transported into the screen in the parallel universe of Darkmoor. Peter and friends end up defeating the evil and restoring the universe to what it was before. The only change is that the crew gets to keep their superpowers so they can protect the Earth if needed. The series was so popular it was set to head to the silver screen, but nothing has been heard about that for about two decades, and it seems Peter Littlecloud will stay tucked away until it's actually picked up again. The torpedo has had quite a few people behind the mask, but only one was a hero. Brock Peters witnessed a fight between the second torpedo and Daredevil. Torpedo 2 went down and Peters tried to save him. Unfortunately, he didn't make it, but was able to get Peters to promise to take up the torpedo mantle before passing. The new Brock Peters torpedo was the first to use the mantle for good, frequently teaming up with Daredevil. He retired from the suit once, but real life now paled in comparison to superhero adventures, and he took it back up again to help fight Chameleon. He was around for about nine years before a battle with the Dire Wraths took him out, so technically he disappeared because he died, which is something that rarely sticks with Marvel, but I think this time it might. At first glance, the hero Sleepwalker looks Looks like a villain, which causes way more problems than you would expect. The MCU judges books by their cover. In reality, Sleepwalker is not just his name, but also his jaw. The Mindscape is a dimension that is in all sentient things, even you and me, and it has beings in it whose sole purpose is to be evil and make people go insane by invading their mind. The Sleepwalkers prevent this from happening and protect the minds of innocents. One of these Sleepwalker guardians was tricked by a longtime enemy into entering the mind of Rick Sheridan. The villain and hero fought in the dream but when the villain escaped, our hero found that they couldn't. Or at least, that was the case for a little while. Pretty soon, it evolved into just remaining on Earth. Eventually, Rick learned of his sleepwalker buddy, and the two became co-inhabitors of Rick's mind. The sleepwalker used his time on Earth to fight the evil entities from the mindscape that materialized. The last time we saw Sleepwalker was in 2018 in Infinity Wars Sleepwalker number 4, where he was very busy destroying nightmares and saving worlds. I hope we see him return. He seems neat. Daisy Johnson, the awesomely powerful S.H.I.E.L.D. agent known as Quake, came on the scene in spectacular fashion as the secret weapon of Nick Fury during his Secret War. She was almost instantly a super popular character. Her power set is also very impressive to boot as an inhuman with super strength, reflexes, speed, and endurance, all of which are known to be slightly greater than the likes of even Captain America. And of course, Quake's main power is vibration manipulation, which allows her to generate massive earthquakes, hence the name. Both her popularity and her power just kind of increased more and more over time, especially with her appearance in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. But then, it seemed that her appearances from that point onward just became less and less frequent, to the point that now she's just kind of gone? I think her last significant appearance was in 2015 in S.H.I.E.L.D. Volume 3, when she faced her own father, Mr. Hyde, and that's a bummer because many a fan loved seeing her. But from Nick Fury's Ace in the Sleeve, to Spider-Man's forgotten sidekick, Alpha. The super incredibly powerful new Spider-Man sidekick known as Alpha seemed to come and go like a fart in the wind. And speaking as an avid farter, I would know. He first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 692 in August of 2012 and was a completely unimpressive Midtown High student who went to visit Horizon Labs where he got exposed to Parker Particles. And yes, that's actually what they're called. He gained the ability to create a hyperkinetic form of cosmic energy tied to the forces of the universe that he could use in blasts and beams, and he could also let off massive explosions and he had tons of other powers too. He became the spokesman for Horizon Labs and the sidekick to Spider-Man. 
but basically he was super irresponsible and unpredictable with his power. For Spider-Man, power and irresponsibility do not go together, and so he depowered Alpha to only about 10% of his original power. Alpha just was not very well liked by fans, and while he continued to operate as a hero and got his own little solo series in 2013, he just kind of stopped appearing at all and has been all but forgotten by Marvel. Or we could talk about Omega the Unknown. Omega the Unknown is one of the wildest superhero concepts I have ever heard of. So basically, back in 1975, Steve Gerber created mechanical beings who lived out on a planet called Protaris, and they were going to be wiped out due to changes to their planet's climate that they just couldn't adapt to. So they created biological humanoid beings who could succeed them and they sent these beings off to other sentient worlds where they could learn and gain skills that they would then pass on to their next model, constantly improving. James Michael Starling was the final model who was sent to Earth and raised by Protarian androids disguised as humans. He had a psychic connection to the previous model, X. Z, who had gained the power of harnessing biospheric energy which was then passed to James Michael Starling and the Protarians knew that this power would be too much for their creations and decided to set out to destroy them. The character or characters as you can tell were absolutely wild but they didn't really stick with readers with X3Z being destroyed by the police in Las Vegas and James completely vaporizing himself and they just stayed gone until he came back, revealed to be stuck in Cthone's other realm in Darkhold Omega in 2022, but just as quickly as he came back, he was completely gone again. Or we could even talk about characters as cool as Darkhawk who still get forgotten about. Darkhawk is one of the most frustrating characters that Marvel has because honestly, he is so cool, but Marvel has no idea what to do with him. Christopher Powell was the son of a cop and a district attorney when he witnessed his father taking a bribe from a mob boss and he stumbled upon an amulet that gave him the ability to transfer his consciousness to the Darkhawk armor. It was an ancient Shi'ar magical armor and it was very cool and it gave Chris quite the set of abilities. Obviously he had the classic superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, and reflexes, but the armor allowed for armament conjuration from the extra dimensional expanse and basically had untapped potential. When he first started out, he was a street level hero, but over time he got a huge power boost and stood shoulder to shoulder with the other big cosmic superheroes out in space. But then they just didn't really know where to go from there. Connor Young became a new version of Darkhawk with an advanced suit of armor that returned the character back to his street roots, but he didn't really hit with fans. The original Christopher Powell character got left with a ton of unanswered questions and showed up last in 2019's Annihilation Scourge, and Connor Young was leading volume 2 of Darkhawk, which just seemed to vanish, I guess? Just kind of stopped. But does anyone here remember Ultra Girl? First appearing in Ultra Girl number 1 from the mid 90s, you'd think that Susanna Sherman's origins and childhood would have been explained in her own solo series, but no, that is not the case for Ultra Girl. Her mutant abilities manifested when a sentinel identified her, but she wasn't just a mutant. Susanna was actually a half Cree mutant, and her real Cree name was, get this, Susanna. It's just Susanna, but with a T at the beginning. We don't know if she was born on Earth or was brought here, but we do know that she was raised on Earth by a group of pink Cree, and they had this whole prophecy that she was gonna be the ultimate unifier, eventually restoring glory to the Cree Empire by defeating both the Shi'ar and the blue-skinned Cree. She had awesome strength, enhanced vision, a healing factor, and the ability to fly, and she used those abilities as a member of the initiative. She even eventually struck up a friendship with Carol Danvers being specifically chosen by her to become the new Miss Marvel, which you would think would be kind of a huge deal. Well, during Dark Reign, Norman Osborn acquired the rights to that title and the costume, and he gave it to Moonstone instead to become Miss Marvel on his Dark Avengers team, and Ultra Girl just kinda had to deal with it. She went on to appear as an applicant to babysit Luke Cage and Jessica Jones' daughter. She showed up at Avengers Academy prom night, formed up with the initiative again during Fear Itself, fought against an evil version of the Young Avengers, and hasn't been seen in any meaningful way since 2014. Now bear with me here for this next point because it's Adam Warlock. This is going to be strange to say, but in a world of superheroes and like godly beings, 
Adam Warlock is like a myth or a legend. He shows up for some humongous cosmic events, but then just as he appears, he disappears again. First appearing in 1967 in Fantastic Four number 66, Adam Warlock was created by the Enclave who were experimenting to create a perfect human specimen. This made him super strong, durable, fast, and able to store and use huge amounts of cosmic energy to make him fly, release blasts, and all kinds of things, including cocooning himself to help him heal and regenerate. Now, every time he cocoons and regenerates, he actually comes out more powerful than what he went in with and evolves new powers. He's able to use quantum magic which lets him teleport, make force fields, move at the speed of light, create wormholes, resurrect himself and others. He has cosmic awareness and he can manipulate, remove and judge the souls of other people. This guy is basically like a big old deus ex machina. But that's the problem. He gets reborn, attunes to a new universal threat, defeats that threat and disappears again. The last time he showed up was in 2018's Infinity Wars which kind of sucked and he just kind of showed up, went inside the soul stone, helped save the day, transported Gamora somewhere completely random in the universe, gave the Infinity Stone sentience, and then he disappeared again, yet to be seen since. But now we're gonna go way back for the Rawhide Kid. A gunslinger from the 1800s with dozens of cowboy adventures to brag about, Johnny Rawhide Kid Bart is one of Marvel Comics' oldest characters, but also one they have seemingly tried to sweep under the rug, just for a little bit. Johnny Bart got his own adult-oriented reboot under the Max imprint, where he was reimagined into a gay gunslinger, and the portrayal of homosexuality within that comic was super criticized for being stereotypical, can't be just plain offensive. What could have been the Rawhide Kid's big push from his relative obscurity instead became a big old embarrassment that Marvel had to apologize for and they subsequently buried the Rawhide Kid. He's had some moments working with the Avengers and the West Coast Avengers but otherwise has pretty much been relegated to background cameos. Now similar to the Rawhide Kid, the Masked Raider is another one of the oldest cowboy heroes in comics, debuting at a time when cowboys were the dominant trend. But because that was literally just the trend of the time, the Masked Raider was quickly lost to time just like a lot of the other cowboy heroes, the Rawhide Kid included. They revived him in their 1000th issue in 2019 but completely reimagined the Masked Raider as a multiversal legacy, meaning the title was to be passed on to different people. Now this huge change to the Masked Raider's backstory and purpose got people pretty excited for what was to come. Marvel even had the Masked Raider's new inheritor teased through cameos and guest appearances with the character in possession of the Eternity Mask, and then just as he was revealed to be some guy named Dr. Carlo Zoda, Marvel buried the whole thing in a really hard to follow time loop in Defenders Volume 6 at the start of 2022, and we haven't really seen him since. But how about a character that hangs out with the X-Men? Hepzibah. An alien from the Mephitisoid species, Hepzibah escaped her planet after she was condemned to become food at a Shi'ar Imperial banquet. Together with her fellow prisoners, she formed the Star Star Jammers, a team of intergalactic travelers with different abilities, and she also became the love interest of Corsair, who was the father of Cyclops, Havoc, and Vulcan, the Summers brothers. After Vulcan wiped out Corsair and Hepzibah ended up stranded on Earth, she basically joined up with the X-Men despite not actually being a mutant. She donned an X-Men suit and accompanied them on missions, specifically creating a bond with Warpath. She fought against the Hulk in World War Hulk without doing diddly squat to the guy. She joined up with X-Force, moved to Utopia with the mutants, almost got deported from Earth by sword, and then in all new X-Men Volume 1 number 23 from 2014, she managed to return to space with the Star Jammers and a returned Corsair, and that is basically as far as it goes. We have not seen her in any significant way since then. And now for this point, Griffin Gogol was just an ordinary plumber with a smoking habit doing his ordinary job when an elderly psychologist couldn't afford to pay the plumbing bill. So instead, this psychologist offered to cure Griffin's smoking habit through hypnosis. Well, what do you know? This psychologist was actually an alien, and the hypnosis had the added benefit of unlocking Griffin's superhuman abilities, which are basically just the same abilities as Superman and the ability to perform any skill at an ultra level. Captain Ultra basically became a joke character. With his new powers, he went out to try and find a new purpose, applying to be a part of a bunch of different teams both heroic and villainous. Teams like the Frightful Four who rejected him for his fear of fire, the Defenders who accepted him but 
very, very briefly, The Initiative, who made him babysit other heroes, and The Revengers. It was with The Revengers where he got himself arrested and he ended up in prison, and he moved around to different prisons, but hasn't really been seen again since 2016, as far as I can tell. I think the fact that he just never became that popular can be for a handful of reasons. For starts, his absolutely horrible painter's palette of a costume, but then there's his incredibly generic name, and the fact that his powers are just Superman, but not as strong, and there are a whole handful of characters with the same kind of thing, but even stronger. Spidey Super Stories are full of villains we never see again. It was a series created in partnership with the children's educational show The Electric Company. The villains can be equally as scary as the ones in the comics, but sometimes they're also a little bit goofy. One goofy guy is The Wall. He is a brick wall. Literally. His backstory is tragic. He was a teen with an after school construction job. A pile of bricks fell on him and he fused with his body, making him a wall. I feel for him. I've said it before, I'll say it again. One of my top irrational fears is that I will be confused with an object if our atoms line up. Poor guy. He's very bad about his circumstance, valid, and takes his anger out on Spider Man, who had nothing to do with it. And on Spider Man's day off, too. The battle took place at a baseball game because that's what Spidey was doing on his day off. It's very clear that the wall survives, him and Spider-Man get kicked out of the game and are seen chilling on a bench outside. But that's it. He's just gone after. The only other thing I can find about him is his Marvel Strike Force profile posted April 1st, 2021. Hopefully he's out there right now getting de-walled by one of the many geniuses of the Marvel Universe. From the X-Men side of it all, we have Spectra. The poor girl is from an unnamed dimension that was consumed by a world eater. She is the only survivor of the event, but there are also other universes that went through the same thing, she ended up joining a group of other survivors called the Magical Resistance. The Resistance encounters the X-Men, and believing them to be working with the World Eater, attack Strike to Kill style, forcing the X-Men to escape to different dimensions. When the Resistance meets the X-Men a second time, Spectre uses her lie detecting powers to figure out that they are all on the same side, and she helps the X-Men fight the World Eater. The World Eater is slain, causing a massive burst of energy. Spectre is able to fly into bodies to control them, she did this to Storm in the first battle and it implies that she's kind of like a ghost. There is a very real possibility that the energy explosion vortex thing didn't hurt her and she's just left because the world eater was taken care of. She hasn't been seen since 2017's Extraordinary X-Men issue 16, but I think she deserves to make a comeback as a hero. She did have some character development and ended up as an ally to the X-Men. Flying Tiger has been around since 1981, debuted in Spider-Woman 40, and then disappeared in Amazing Spider-Man 18 in 2018. Flying Tiger was a former American football player when his professional career failed. He turned his skills to villainhood. He became a talented assassin with a 100% success rate. Until Spider-Woman, of course. Since his debut, he has battled Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, and of course, the last hero to see him alive, Spider-Man. The thing is, we don't have a confirmation that he died. In Amazing Spider-Man 18, Spider-Man, along with most villains he's fought in his career, are being chased by robot Kraven the Hunters. Taskmaster and Black Ant created robots modeled after Kraven so they could host the Great Hunt, an event where the rich can pay large amounts of cash to get put in a virtual reality space where they control the robots and are able to get revenge on the villains that wronged them. The rich do not hold back. We see the iguana either die or get critically injured. Flying Tiger is tackled mid-air and that's all we see. He's not in the comics after it, so it's unclear whether he escaped or not. J. Jonah Jameson may make Peter Parker's life infinite more difficult than needed, but nobody deserves to have their birthday cake stolen, and by a villain, no less. The Birthday Bandit is another goofy villain created for the Spidey Super Stories. His entire thing is that he goes around ruining birthdays by stealing all the party supplies. The biggest birthday cake in the city currently belongs to the Triple J, and the Birthday Bandit wants it. He breaks into the building, grabs the massive cake, only to be webbed by Spider-Man. Unfortunately, the damage is done and the cake is completely ruined. Jameson walks into a smashed cake and doesn't know whether to blame Spider-Man or the bandit. He does chuck a piece of cake at Spider-Man though, and poor Peter is forced to spend his day off in his birthday suit doing laundry. The bandit is presumably sent to jail, but who knows if this wacky villain will make a comeback. Happy birthday to anybody who's celebrating today, but keep an eye out just in case the bandit is still on the loose. Personally, with all the wacky villains that Spider-Man has had to deal with, 
I think we need a Lego Spider-Man movie the way that they did Lego Batman because in Lego Batman they brought back all the random people he's fought over the years no matter how goofy they are so I think we need one for Spider-Man. That's personally my choice for this but let me know in the comments down below which hero you would pick. From the same universe and looking equally as ridiculous is Fancy Dancer. This guy is a bigger deal than the last one, okay? Spider-Man has had to team up with Miss Marvel this time to take him down. Fancy Dancer kidnapped the principal dancer in the ballet and planned to take her back to his studio. He gets found by the two heroes backstage and a fight breaks out. Numerous blows and dance puns are thrown around until Spider-Man takes him out by pushing him in a fountain. The kidnapped dancer is returned to the ballet and Fancy Dancer is never seen again. Former head of the Brotherhood of Evil Musicians hasn't been seen since his debut in the powerful Pachyderms in 1989. Clarinetto is an intelligent man. He has been posing as a music teacher at a music conservatory. But he wasn't teaching people music, he was teaching them to become celebrity impersonator warriors. There is a musical battle of epic proportions that takes place and it ends with one of the super elephants creating a super blast that takes out the school and presumably everyone in it. We don't see Clarinetto ever again, which could be because he was blown away, but the power elephants were only ever meant to be a one hit wonder, so we'll never know if Clarinetto made it out. Although he was a fan of the leader of the wrong side of World War II, so I think he can just stay away, that's okay. The Thought Police in George Orwell's 1984 are probably the most famous, but Marvel has also toyed with the idea in three issues of Sleepwalker. Three issues for three members. Marvel's Thought Police were made up of wiretap, he can jam communications between any device, there was also Nightstick, he was a very strong brick wall of a man, not literal this time, and he was considered the group's leader. And finally, Cuffs, a regular woman with special mittens. She had gauntlets that would expel highly versatile liquid, similar to clay, that she could manipulate to attack from a distance. The trio tricked the Fantastic Four into helping with their mission of ending the hero Sleepwalker. Sleepwalker does look like a villain, so the Fantastic Four judge a book by its cover and agree to help. Sleepwalker is connected to a human host, so they must go into the host's mind to get him. But once the F4 realize that Sleepwalker isn't the villain, they turn on the trio. Everybody battles and then eventually the Thought Police and Fantastic Four are back on Earth. The Thing was about to clobber the group, but they were considered to be part of a government sanctioned operation, and if he did, he would be arrested. So the Thought Police are left with a government high up and who knows where they are now. That was back in 1991 in issues 14, 15, and 16 of Sleepwalker. We have a member of another brotherhood in the house. This time we are looking at Lifter of the Brotherhood of Mutants. Lifter's abilities include density manipulation. He can give himself super strength just by changing his body density. He can also manipulate gravity, reducing its effect on what he touches. Magneto created the Brotherhood, but when he left the picture, the group changed their name to become Mutant Force. They were working for Mandrill as soldiers for hire, fighting the Defenders. Then the Mutant Force moved on to join the Secret Empire as thugs, again battling the Defenders. The group reinvented themselves a second time, becoming the Resistance, a group against the Mutant Registration Act. Lifter and Mutant Force would protest by causing disturbances around the world and organizing rallies. All good things must come to an end, and eventually the villain squad parted ways. Back in 2021, Lifter ended up volunteering to have his powers taken by Snark, so I think he has truly disappeared to go live a normal life. Good for him. This next man is iconic. Literally, his name is Icon. He appeared in two issues, Excalibur 59 and 60. He was a Wakandan biochemist who experimented on himself in their advanced labs. He ended up giving himself the ability to turn himself and others into wood. With his newfound power, he set his eyes on the Wakandan throne. He had the idea in his head that Black Panther did not respect him as a scientist. One night during a celebration, Icon shows up and starts turning people to wood. Luckily, the Avengers are in attendance, something Icon did not plan for. He does have an ace up his sleeve. When someone is turned into wood, they are then under his control. Black Panther will not let the Avengers attack the wooden people as they are his subjects. But worry not, out of nowhere comes this guy called Jungle Man to distract Icon, giving the Avengers their moment to start the fight. Only Icon surrenders very quickly. See, his whole plan rested on taking the throne quickly through fear, because the turning to wood thing only lasts an hour. The change back makes him 
pass out and he's carried away by Black Panther. That's all folks, he was an old man so maybe natural causes took him out, but he is literally never seen again. Cold Heart, a villain with a point. Sadly, she hasn't been seen since Avengers standoff. Cold Heart has had a tragic life. Her son was caught in the crossfire of a hero and villains battle and sadly passed away. From that day on, the heartbroken mother has hated heroes because she believes they never get a proper punishment for when they level a city during a fight and innocent lives are lost. She has a point. To get her revenge on the heroes of the world, she stole her costume from the government agency she worked for. Her suit is bulletproof and comes with two cryonic swords that can freeze anything they touch. She primarily fights Spider-Man and he is one of the only heroes that has survived her pursuit of them. She was inspired by his good nature and genuine want to protect civilian lives that she let him go. She eventually lands herself in prison but escapes in New Avengers. This woman is tough. She survived the Stamford explosion and then ends up in Shield's pleasant Hill Prison, eventually joining in on the massive Avengers standoff battle. And then we haven't seen her since. She is a highly trained martial artist and swordswoman, suggesting that she was probably a field agent of some sort when she worked at the agency. So maybe she just slipped away and is living a quiet life again. For example, we've got Armless Tiger Man. Gustav Hertz worked in a mechanical laboratory in Munich, Germany during the 1940s. Now unfortunately for Hertz, one day his arms got caught in a machine and had to be amputated. While this is a horrible thing to happen to anybody, Gustav did survive the experience and he was later given reading material on how to operate day to day without arms, instead using his mouth and feet to complete daily tasks. Turns out that he was really, really good at this. Hertz developed ridiculous skill in using his teeth and feet. He even took things a couple steps further. He sharpened his teeth into fangs so that he could bite people, and he even developed above average levels of strength and dexterity in his jaw, legs, and toes, allowing him to bend steel with his mouth, kick really, really hard, and throw daggers with his toes. He ended up proving how capable he was as a World War II enemy of the hero Angel and Wakanda, where he was completely destroyed by that era's Black Panther. What was really surprising was when he reappeared in Incredible Hercules number 129 to 131 in 2009. He was among a group of individuals that were the Greek god Pluto's jury of the undead, and they together put Zeus on trial and subdued Hercules himself. Past that though, Armless Tiger Man has appeared one more time in Ziggy Pig Silly Seal Comics Volume 2 Number 1 in 2019, and let's be honest, no one really read that. Now, Hulk villains are always a fun thing to talk about because they are either super smart or incredibly powerful, both of which make for a fun read. The character Ravage is one villain that is both of those things wrapped into one, which makes it all the more puzzling that he has completely disappeared. Dr. Jeffrey Crawford was a former mentor of Bruce Banner, who used the Hulk's gamma radiation to cure himself of a debilitating neuromuscular disease, while pretending that he was trying to help Banner cure himself of the Hulk persona. Unfortunately, like a good chunk of others who have subject themselves to gamma, Crawford became a big old green monster who was subject to fits of rage. But unlike a good chunk of other gamma mutates, Jeffrey kept his wits and was both an incredibly strong villain able to rival the Hulk physically, but also cunning and able to outthink the Hulk as well. He had this plan to try and become Ravage full time instead of only temporarily hulking out. Banner had to team up with General Ross to try and bring him down, resulting in a huge brawl between the two green goliaths, but it was actually Major Talbot who used a cryogenic inducer to freeze Ravage, and he was kept in suspended animation at Gamma Base, being researched for ways to defeat the Hulk himself, and the last mention of him was way back in 1998. What always boggles me is when a villain has an absolutely huge backstory that ties into the Elder Gods and the greater Marvel godly planes, but then they just like never show up. For example, Echidna, or Echidna, however you want to pronounce it. Echidna, or Echidna, was an Elder Spawn, the granddaughter of the Elder God known as Set, who is a big deal in Marvel Comics. Set was the first Elder God to realize that he could steal the power of his other Elder Gods by consuming them, which kicked off a whole massive war between the Elder Gods turning 
turning most of them into demons. So his granddaughter is not someone to mess with. Echidna is the mother of all monsters. She made Angerboda, Cerberus, Chimera, the Lernaean Hydra, the Nemean Lion, and the Sphinx, just to name a few. Despite that though, in the modern day, she has been a part of some just straight up sucky teams. In 2013, she became a part of the second Doom Maidens team under Caroline Le Fay, who were eventually able to resurrect Morgana Le Fay. And in 2018, she became a part of Namor the Submariner's Defenders of the Deep when he decided that land dwellers weren't allowed in the ocean. And she stayed part of that Atlantean team until she turned on Namor and challenged him for the Atlantean throne and got defeated by Ghost Rider when the Avengers showed up back in 2021. Now, the villain Dr. Bong was a goofy villain even during the Golden Age. He has a metal ball where his left hand should be and he uses it to create concussive blasts by striking the appendage against his bell-shaped helmet. We actually have no idea how he came to become Dr. Bong because his backstory mainly just touches on how he was a bullied kid who found power in writing and language, so then he became a very unethical reporter and then tried to become a celebrity and joined up as a performer with a rock band where he would play different characters and one of those performances got out of hand when his hand got cut off by a guillotine. I wish I was making that up. Now chronologically, he then appeared in Howard the Duck number 15 in May of 1977 as Dr. Bong with random knowledge of biological engineering and sonics. He faced Howard and eventually She-Hulk and then in 2010's Deadpool Volume 2, the villain was reimagined just a smidge bit more threateningly as Deadpool's former therapist and having cloned a team of superheroes giving his clones regeneration abilities. He then joined a group called the Villains Anonymous who all had run-ins with Spider-Man and the last time he was seen was in 2014's Amazing Spider-Man Annual Volume 2, number one. Now this next one may be one of the more revolting villains out there, and it only gets worse when you learn that Douglas Carmody, the bogeyman or boogeyman, was a villain to the Power Pack, a group of kids. Carmody was in charge of the Carmody Research Labs where Dr. James Power was working to perfect his antimatter power generator. When the Power Pack gained their abilities from the destruction of the generator, Carmody lost his job and essentially blamed the power pack for it all. Classic villain backstory. He then went on to hunt the power pack, considering them mutants, even though they weren't. He stole a battle suit from Project Pegasus, and using this suit to try and wipe out the power pack, he ended up coming into battle with Asgard's Warriors 3 and the New Mutants. Now in power pack number 40, a demon named Nastir, I think is how you pronounce it, invaded New York City, and he turned several people, including Bogeyman, or Boogeyman, into demons. And for Carmody, he basically embraced it completely, permanently staying as a demon while the others returned to normal. He tried to wipe out the power pack again with his new abilities, but then he saw himself in a reflection and went tumbling off a building. That was back in 1988. He appeared one more time in 1993's Cage Volume 1, number 19, facing Luke Cage, where he apparently passed away. But this isn't confirmed, and so he is basically considered missing, which isn't at all a pleasant thought. Now, similar to how the High Evolutionary created the new men, he also created the Man Beast from a red wolf that he genetically modified. However, unlike the new men, Man Beast was created using a new isotope which granted him a heightened physicality and enhanced mental capabilities, also granting him a greater level of ambition. He terrorized Counter-Earth, or more accurately, he led a revolt against the High Evolutionary, which, I mean, that isn't really so bad. That guy sucks. But he was eventually stopped by Thor before he could do real damage. He tried this two more times actually, being defeated by Wolverine and Kitty Pride the first time, and then on Counter-Earth, he was stopped by Adam Warlock, who slightly devolved Man-Beast, which is kind of terrifying to think about. He would then return again on Earth as the hate monger, having seemingly re-evolved back into his normal self. But then he was defeated by Spider-Man, and he was thought to be actually killed, but nope, he actually tried to stop the High Evolutionary again, infiltrating his Knights of Wonder Gore in the late 90s. Unfortunately for the Man Beast, the High Evolutionary and Quicksilver devolved him back into a wolf, but he's returned from that before, so who knows? Next up is the villain known as Belladonna. Belladonna was actually a Spider-Man villain, but it's more accurate to call her a villain to another Spidey villain, Roderick Kingsley, aka Hobgoblin. But before that ever happened, Belladonna was Narda Ravana, a European fashion designer. The problem was that Kingsley was another famous fashion designer, only one that stole from other designers. 
Studios. Kingsley allegedly stole Ravana's designs and marketed them in the United States, stealing her success, and for that, I guess he had to pay. Swearing vengeance, Narda assumed the guise of Belladonna and put together a small group of henchmen. She used toxic gas as her main tool, creating gas that could dissolve Spider-Man's webs, taking people's lives and having her henchmen dress as the Prowler to distract Spider-Man, all for the end goal of wiping out Kingsley from the face of the Earth. The most ironic part of this whole situation, though, is that Belladonna just didn't have the popularity needed to be a lasting villain, getting arrested in 1980, while Kingsley, he became the Hobgoblin, and he's been causing problems all the way up until 2020 and is bound to come back at some point. Okay, so next up is a group of obscure villains made for the express purpose of facing another obscure group of heroes. Heavy Metal was a team made up of a group of cybernetically enhanced super intelligent animals with weaponized exoskeletons. Can't get much more comic booky than that. Their team members included Armory, an octopus because arms, get it? Tail Gunner, a vulture, Bloodbath, a shark, Ramrod, a rhino, and they were led by Uproar, a blue-faced gorilla. Now this team was created by Adam Frost of Multicorp as a prototype, privately owned attack force set to oppose the team known as Brute Force, which is also a team of cybernetically enhanced super intelligent animals with weaponized exoskeletons. Also created by Multicorp, but they were created by Dr. Randall Pierce, and these guys were good. Except the problem is, both of these teams were really just a part of Weapons Plus, the ones who created Captain America and eventually Wolverine. And they are not exactly the best people around. Heavy Metal was around for four issues of the Brute Force comic in 1990, and they have never been seen since. Remember back when I talked about Echidna or Echidna, and we talked about the Defenders of the Deep? Well, this team was basically filled with water-based villains that had nothing better to do, and one of them was a guy called Tiger Shark. So get this, Todd Arliss was a swimmer who took part in the Olympic Games. Cool. He ended up damaging his spinal cord when he rescued a drowning man. Dang. He was so desperate to regain his swimming ability that he then willingly participated in an experiment by the scientist Dr. Lemuel Dorkes. Interesting. The doctor blended Arliss's DNA with that of Namor the Submariner and a tiger shark, because of course he did. This experiment was totally successful, only it completely changed Arliss both physically and mentally. Now he had razor sharp teeth and gills and had become savage and incredibly aggressive. He became a supervillain and named himself Tiger Shark, becoming an adversary for Namor the Submariner. Now funnily enough though, after years and years of battling against Namor and the superhero community, he joined the Defenders of the Deep and now he hasn't been seen since 2019 when they attacked an oil drilling platform in Alaska. And last up for today is Bram Velsing. For starters, he has an incredibly strange name that is very obviously a reference to Bram Stoker and his character Van Helsing. So Bram Velsing, also known as Dread Knight, is better known as an enemy to Tony Stark in the Ultimate Universe. Unfortunately, in the 1610 universe, he just becomes another Iron Man villain that creates another Iron Man-like armor. But in Earth 616, Bram Velsing was actually a Latvarian scientist who didn't like Dr. Doom's schemes and was punished by having a mask fused to his face. He became kind of like a villain, but also a servant to Dr. Doom in a way, allying himself with Victoria Frankenstein and the creations of Victor Frankenstein, which would make you think that he was actually a hero, but he was never played that way. He eventually moved on from being just a Dr. Doom villain and has gone on to fight Iron Man on a few occasions, as well as the Black Knight and Spider-Man. He was this really cool looking armored up man with an even cooler mask wielding a super cool lance riding a black winged horse? It was dope, but curiously, while he's never actually been sent to the afterlife, his last appearance was serving Doctor Doom in Iron Man Legacy Volume 1 Number 3 back in 2010, and he hasn't been seen since. While Wrong Slide has been around recently, I wanted to include him here because I think ever since Rock Slide became Wrong Slide, he's been mainly relegated to a background character. Rock Slide himself was also seemingly brought back just to be sacrificed during the Ten of Swords event in the lead up to the Otherworld tournament. He was one of the mutants who perished in Otherworld, allowing the mutants of Krakoa to learn that dying in Otherworld meant you basically couldn't be resurrected in the same way. Initially it was actually believed you might not be able to be resurrected at all, but we later managed to bring back those fallen mutants, however they were then 
very much changed by the experience permanently, turning Rock Slide into a very different entity, which we even renamed as Wrong Slide. Now, while Wrong Slide did recently appear back in April 2024, it's important to note that one, in that appearance, he was again just completely removed, just killed off, and two, this technically isn't even the same character as Rock Slide, who perished way back during the Ten of Swords period during the Krakoan era, which was a few years ago now. It's actually weird to think that Ten of Swords happened that long ago. It feels in some ways like it was yesterday to me. I don't know, time is weird like that. Are there any events that you feel like just happened, but they definitely did not? <laughs> Let me know in the comments. iBoy is a mutant with a higher level of perception because he's covered in eyeballs. iBoy might seem like a strange mutant and hero, but I'm gonna be honest, I cannot deny that I just downright love this guy. Even though, yeah, he's kind of a weird one to look at and to have, I don't know, thought up in terms of his existence even. iBoy has since been revealed to have more than just enhanced vision though. He can see things that others can't, basically seeing through to other planes at times, and also seeing and understanding the world around him on an atomic level, due to his inhuman level of sight. It's a pretty specific power, but can be super useful given the right circumstances. iBoy had a period in the Krakoan era where he was more relevant as he ended up on the X Factor team for a while, investigating mutant mysteries, pretty fun. But unfortunately, he has not been as prominently featured since the end of that series and its wrap-up story, Trial of Magneto. He has since appeared in the X-Men Unlimited series, which is part of Marvel's online only exclusive Infinity line on Marvel Unlimited, but even there, I don't think he's appeared since like early last year, so it's still been quite a minute. Even with her ability actually being super cool and super useful, it's still a super gross one to be honest. That's right, we're talking about Husk. And it's no surprise that we forgot who Husk was for a bit, only to remember her again briefly during the Krakoan era, before almost immediately having her disappear just as quickly after she reappeared, it feels like. Husk is a mutant and member of the X-Men who is able to shed her skin to reveal a new composite layer underneath. For example, she sheds a layer of skin and underneath she could be fiery. Mostly, this just sounds pretty heckin' awesome. She can kind of do it with like any materials as well. However, there have been times when Husk has been mentally unstable, resulting in her having less control over her abilities. And shedding your skin involuntarily, I'm gonna be real with you, that would be super disturbing. Not just the idea of it, but also when when Husk sheds her skin involuntarily, it gets like all patchy and freaky looking, so I'm not surprised that she just kind of comes into the spotlight and then fades away. <laughs> a member of the version of X-Force, which would evolve into X-Statics, Anarchist joined the group as a replacement member after the death of Sluck. His powers include being able to produce electrochemical energy, which can be used to create powerful blast. How does he produce this energy? Why, through his acid sweat, of course. But that's right, when it comes to Anarchist, that is how he does it. Although the byproduct of his weird abilities are pretty awesome, the ability itself, sweating acid, honestly pretty nasty. But like sweat wasn't gross enough by itself. If you make it acid, it just kind of gets more disturbing and gross. Anarchist showed up last, I believe, in the first Excellent series, but even there he only appeared in a flashback, sadly. He also was shown to have joined the mutant nation of Krakoa, fun fact, but he's even been more of a background character there in regards to that. For some of the weirdest heroes, we can look to the Great Lakes Avengers, who are generally known for being a much more wacky and often eccentric team of heroes whose powers are oddly specific in a way that usually doesn't seem too useful, I'd say. Case in point, Doorman. Doorman got a power upgrade after his death, but before that, his powers weren't really that extraordinary. At least not in how they were presented in the comics. Also, he was stuck with the bizarre name of Doorman, so, you know, that could have probably been better. Doorman was so named because he could use his powers to act as a doorway for people, allowing them to pass through solid barriers. This, however, is actually because of Doorman's connection to, fun fact, the Dark Dimension, which he uses to allow people to pass through him, effectively teleporting them through barriers via the Dark Force. His attachment to the Dark Force also gives him a slew of other useful abilities at this point, similar to magic or Kitty Pride, you might say, although, you know, neither of them are necessarily attached to the Dark Dimension, they have their own things, but I digress. And fun fact, while Doorman is not known for being an X-Men and instead is known for his affiliation rather with the GLA or the GLI primarily, he also just so happens to be a mutant, which is why I've included him here. So in that way, he is somewhat connected to the team while still being very much removed from it. But hey, he's still a mutant, so 
I'm gonna count. Bailey Hoskins is known for being the worst X-Man ever, probably because his powers are pretty lackluster sounding, to be real with you, but managed to pack a pretty big bang when they do get used. Bailey's powers involve self-detonation, but the only thing is that activating his powers will actually also, uh, unfortunately, result in his death, meaning he can only use them once and doing so will, yes, kill him. However, he does end up doing this, and in doing so actually saves the entire world, or at least a world. His good friend and teammate Miranda has reality warping powers that are extremely powerful, propelling her into her own classification of mutant even, beyond Omega. But even then, Miranda can't seem to interfere in this world. It seems that she needs some help from Bailey, and in sacrificing himself he not only saves the world, but also seemingly helps Miranda to fix it and set it right again. Bailey is definitely a mutant who was introduced only to disappear right after his story concluded because he was kind of just created just for that story, but this is also because his story is believed to be set in a totally different universe. His story is an interesting one and the idea of his character is honestly just fascinating to me and I'd love to see it in the main continuity. A mutant who is with the X-Men but whose power basically is a one-time use, making him appear pretty much normal despite being a mutant, and also making him mostly useless as a mutant superhero, at least you know, for most of his life. While a student at the Xavier Institute, I don't believe Slick ever made the main X-Men team, nor has he been featured on any spin-off mutant team either, I believe, but still, Xavier Institute, so we're counting him. Slick's powers were charisma based. He basically exuded charisma and made himself likable. He could also cast illusions, as we'd later learn when he and Quentin Quire's Kid Omega butted heads. The two didn't get along, and at one point Quire used his powers to just dispel the illusions that Slick was constantly casting. Honestly, a pretty rude move, but that's what happened. These illusions made him appear as a handsome young man, but this was not actually his true appearance, it turned out. He also had a physical mutation as a mutant, and appeared as a small, web-footed creature with pointed ears. Kind of um, impish or goblin looking, if you will. After having his true appearance revealed at the moment when he was working on a song with his girlfriend Tattoo, she broke up with him. I feel bad for Amber. She got one pretty cool story where she is clearly established as a college kid who just wants to live her life and despite being a mutant, doesn't really let this define who she is or what she's capable of. And then, right after we think, wow, that's really cool, that's, that's a really interesting take on what being a mutant could be like, Amber could be a really cool character to follow along just even in this like kind of slice of life story with her. Or especially if she was pulled into becoming a mutant superhero and had to join the X-Men or something like that. But no, she gets depowered during M-Day. Or at least that's what I believe happened to her. I don't think she's ever specifically seen after her adventure with Jono that she appears in during her appearance in his Chamber series. Amber was definitely weird to behold because her default physical mutation made her green and covered in her in spikes. But she was also a shapeshifter who typically shapeshifted into a beautiful woman, but only in her dreams, only when she was really sleeping. She could also control this ability though, I think. I think she just mainly preferred to appear as she was naturally. Kind of like Mystique, but what if Mystique wasn't a baddie and just kind of wanted to like chill and go to college. Honestly, a super interesting story. I wish Amber wasn't just this kind of one-off character, but that's kind of what she became, honestly.